Hey everyone, this is Rick at Mad Finger Games, Head of Communications, and we just had an incredible interview with Sean McFate. Now, Sean McFate is an expert at national security, foreign policy, and terrorism, and he's served in at several PMCs. He has a lot of experience, and he's a, definitely a huge inspiration to us, uh, and also an expert novelist. So I hope you really enjoy the interview and see how it ties into the game, uh, even how we got the name of our game, what Grey Zone Warfare means, and then some. So... Thanks a lot. We really appreciate your guys' support, and uh, we'll talk soon. Yeah, so, Sean, we really wanted to thank you for taking the time out to be able to talk to us. But obviously, not only us, but, you know, creators and fans can get to know more about you and how much you've impacted our game in terms of inspiration. There are conversations with Mara, who, as we know, is our co-founder and creative director of the game, and he does some designing himself. So, um, you know, really wanted to appreciate, you know, you taking the time out. And I think before maybe we even start with like the first question, if you'd like to just talk a little bit about your background. Okay. Sure. So I started off um, as a U.S. Army paratrooper in the 82nd Airborne Division. I did that for many years. I got out. I did what some would call went to the dark side. I became a private military contractor globally, not just the guys in Iraq or Afghanistan, but globally. Um, and a private military contract is kind of a euphemism for what some might consider mercenary. And initially I worked on U.S. government contracts, and then I became freelance. And then I did that for many years. And at some point I realized that there were no, there were a few old people in my business. Hmm. So I decided to get out, and uh, I'd also seen some very disturbing things. I wanted to think deeply about them. So Ever since then, I've, I've really been trying to pull back the curtain on the world of the growing world of private military companies, how they work, how they're shaping international affairs, all these things. Um, and that's sort of what led me in some ways to, to bump into Mad Finger Games. Yeah, I mean, it's really wild, which is why we absolutely want to like get to know more of, um, you know, we already talked about your background, but, you know, how, how did then you get to work with us, right? Like what was, how did you meet, we'll say Mara or what, what, what happened? Well, I got an email, <laughs> like so many things in the world today is uh, I got an email from Mara saying, Hey, uh, I just read a book, uh, that you had written, um, called the new rules of war or the modern mercenary on muscle novelist. I, I, I've talked about this world through novels, through nonfiction. Mm -hmm. Uh, he ran into some of that and he just reached out to me and said, Hey, we're designing this game. Would you mind having a conversation. I said, sure, of course. And then one thing led to another. And uh, I have also found it to be deeply fascinating to see how a game is created. I had no clue. Yeah. Okay. And and that's always interesting. Sometimes it's like a random email or something and all of a sudden it's almost like meant to be. So with that said, like what what is your, you know, to let these guys and gals know, what is your cooperation with us, right? Like how how are you working with us just to let everyone kind of get an inside scoop? Sure. So I guess I'm like the technical advisor. I mean, if this were like a movie, I'd be the guy from that world explaining how these things would really happen. Not not with any of the video game or decoding. That's I have no clue about that. It's sort of the, that the technical advisor who explains like this is what would happen. This would not happen. This is a language they'd use. This is what they'd look like. This is how the operation would go to make it as realistic as possible but yet make it a fun game. Okay. And that, that leads me to this. We, uh, we had a, a creator who, he said, you know, Grey Zone Warfare, that's kind of an odd name. He's like, I don't like that name. I'm not like quoting him verbatim. But like I feel because we haven't really talked too much about what Grey Zone Warfare even means. So, yeah. so in your, your perspective with the books you've written, your actual experience to top it off, how would you define, uh, define Grey Zone Warfare? Well, one of my jobs now is I advise the Pentagon uh, on things like special operations and all these things that go on in the shadows of modern warfare. And what the Pentagon calls this type of warfare, they call it gray zone warfare. And gr think of gray zone as what happens in the twilight between you're not at peace, but you're not at war. And this is areas of special operations forces, Delta Force, SEAL teams. This is what they do. This is what they're doing in Syria right now. This is what they're doing around the world in places people will be surprised. 
So this is called gray zone warfare. It's covert operations. Right. So, you know, in other words, too, there's other tactics that are used that are not militaristic means that uh, a lot like psychological impact and effect and right, that sort of thing. Well, it's that, but it's also very creative and yeah. it's very ethically challenged, to say the least. Um, so it's, it's also using things like proxy forces and using weird technologies. I mean, we're not talking about battle tanks and submarines. We're talking about small groups of cradle, creative, highly trained, very lethal, very entrepreneuring teams of fighters who, go, who insert via parachute or, uh, you know, a helicopter. Or... So one of my jobs uh, for Mad Finger is to explain how that world works. And then how does it work on the private side? Because we know there are like public militaries like, you know, U.S. Army, Green Berets. But what happens when Green Berets leave the Green Berets and become freelance? And that changes things entirely because gray zone warfare is now really bleeding into the private warfare space and it's changing warfare in surprising ways. So, so that was, that's what leads me to this. And like, what is the current situation with PMCs across the globe? You know, yeah. that's kind of a broad question, but. So PMCs are, you know, if you look at the last 20 to 30 years, PMCs have been growing at an exponential rate. Mercenaries, PMCs, whatever you want to call them, you know. And when most people think of this, they think of maybe companies like Blackwater um, it's, or maybe the Wagner Group today. But it's, it's, it's much more interesting than that. Um, you're seeing, uh, you know, extractive industries, oil companies hire them, mining companies, billionaires hiring them to get out of jail in places like Tokyo. I mean, it's crazy. So, and you're seeing also private CIAs, private intelligence firms, and they work, they can work very closely with these private military companies. Uh, and I've done both by the way. So that's what I'm kind of bringing to this world. But yeah. the, you know, we're getting to the, the point where anybody who has enough money can swipe a check and rent a private army, rent a, like a, a special operations force. I mean, it's a billionaire, a, a Fortune 500 company. They could wage war for any reason they want, no matter how petty or how weird. Um, and they're not, you know, a good luck finding a patriotic CEO, right? So <laughs> warfare is changing. Warfare, it's, it's going back in some ways to like the world of the Middle Ages in Europe when you had, you know, popes and aristocratic families and city-states all fighting via mercenaries rather than through sort of national armies like World War II. Mm. And one of the things I think we want to reveal in this game is what that world actually looks like. You know, who's in that world? What are they doing what they're doing? What are they, what are they doing it for? Yeah. Yeah. All those things. Yeah, ab absolutely. Because we know in the game, it may not be a story-driven game or like cut scenes per se, but there is this mature story theme that will – keep people interested in coming back for more and there's incentives. Um, you've kind of alluded to that with PMCs, like they're usually on a mission to collect something important and report, bring it back. And then they all, these big guys do what they want with these things. Right. Yeah. <laughs> to put it loosely. Um, so uh, we, we actually, you know, as you know, obviously you and I had a call before this, but, and we touched on, is there really a difference between PMCs and mercenaries? You know, what would you say? I don't think there's a, any difference. I mean, there's been lots of experts who are trying to explain that there is some sort of difference, but I'll tell you, as, one, as somebody who's coming from that world, the, the line between a private military contractor and a mercenary is blurry because if you have the skill set to do one, then you can easily do the other. And yeah. it depends on the market circumstances and the will of the individual, and that's it. Got it. Okay. Very interesting, then, because that, that's kind of like, you know, sometimes it breaks down even stereotypes, per se. Yeah. Um, okay, then. So how does, you know, one actually get to be a PMC? And, you know, why do people do it? What's, what's the incentive? And then uh, you've kind of talked about this already, but about, like, hiring PMCs. Uh, does it pay well? That sort of thing. So a lot of questions in one. Yeah, I mean, so I'll tell you how I got sucked into this world. It was by happenstance. I... Um... I left the army. I didn't know what to do with myself. 
Um, and then I got a call one day, randomly, and it went something like this. You don't know who we are, but we know who you are. Would wow. you mind having a business discussion uh, about something that would interest you? I'm like, who's this? And they said, well, we'll tell you. And I, they flew me down to Dallas, which is where their headquarters was at the time. And they explained to me, look, we need to raise a, a small army in Africa for the U.S. government. And we know that you have the skill sets to do this. And your name came highly recommended. And I was like, huh? And, um, and I, I, they said, this go off for two weeks and write us a report about how you would do it and come back and we'll discuss. So I went off to this place for two weeks. I talked, I looked, interviewed, I sort of, you know, patted around and I came back and I said, this is how I do it. And they said, fine, you're hired. What, what, what do you want to be paid? And we had a negotiation and they paid me about just over twice as much as I would got, I would have gotten in the U S army at my rank. Wow. Uh, which was pretty good. Yeah. And so I did that, and then one contract turned into another, and then eventually I left that company and went freelance. Um, but I chose my clients very carefully. I chose clients that would not, like, um, you know, get me in trouble with the U.S. State Department or U.S. You know, Department of Defense. I didn't, like, work for China or for Iran yeah. or Russia. Um, but I did work for, like, oil companies and mining companies, which was interesting. Um, and so that's kind of how it works. It's the, the private military world, it's, it's an illicit economy, a little bit like narco gangs, right? Like you have to be invited in and it's all who you know. And yeah. there's a lot of fraud in that space, but you can easily tell who's faking it versus making it. I mean, you can tell somebody says, okay, I was an ex SEAL team guy. Oh, okay. What unit were you in? Who was the command? You could like in, five questions you can figure out if they're telling you the truth or they're you know bullshit artists yeah yeah yeah. Uh, so uh which is a big problem in this world right um so um and that's and i but the thing i is when you work in this world you work on this sort of multinational team you, i i work with people from africa from latin america from you know asia from the uk i mean every everywhere and yeah trying to learn how to make such a weird team work with different people come, they always come from some sort of military background, usually in my level, an elite background. And mm -hmm. so it's also very interesting too, to see what, you know, a Colombian yep. guy can do versus say a SAS British guy versus whatever. And it's, it's a different way of warfare. You know what, this, this is something I just thought of and I thought it would be an interesting question to ask, even in pertaining to our game, what happens when one PMC, so one private military company, run into another one on the same field with a certain yeah. mission, per se? What well, if it's, <laughs> <laughs> if it's a surprise, it can go bad south. It can go south very quickly or sideways, as they say. Okay. So, I mean, it's one thing if you know that you're in the same area of operation, you might yeah. try to coordinate just to say, hey, this is our turf, this is your turf. And, that's, and that doesn't always, that's not clean. But, it, it, um, you know, think of it again. I mean, it's a little bit like international criminal organizations, I mean, that are highly sophisticated, right? right, right. Um, yeah, that, you know, when they see each other, they, they can, it could be an impromptu firefight. Um, and, of course, one of the concerns is that's not fratricide, that you're not working on the same side when don't even know it. Uh, because employers don't always tell PMC teams who, who they've employed. Yeah. Sometimes an employer will, will hire two PMCs to do similar things, and the PMCs don't know it, and they run into each other, and it can get bloody very quickly. So there's a lot of um, there's a lot of danger in this way of warfare. It's not like working in the U.S. Army in Iraq. It's quite different. It's a different jungle. And, and I'm glad you really said all this because just thinking about our game, just because you see another you know PMC, another faction coming around the corner does not mean you you have to engage with them. Right. You, know, you can simply, maybe even you want to hide, maybe you just kind of go east while they're going west, right? right. Or maybe you want to engage because you're curious to see what they have on them and you want to kind of collect that, you know? Right. Um, so the, these are sort of things that we like, we call it a sandbox in an open world where you can make decisions. Right. So I, I, I think sometimes what you're saying is going to happen even in the game. And that's what we wanted to ask you next is, 
you know, obviously we know we still have a long ways to go, but so far, what are your initial thoughts like on the game itself, the environment atmosphere type thing, you know? Well, I, I love how uh, dedicated Mara and the, and the coders are to making it realistic. I mean, I went to visit their studios uh, not too long ago and they were like, they were, they were like looking at how soldiers move. They had soldiers from the military come there. They were going out to the range to record bullets flying overhead. I mean, every little detail, which is great. And, um, and also trying to capture this new way of warfare. I mean, when all, when we think about war, we think of like, you know, war when you're wearing a uniform, right? Mm -hmm. Whether, you know, call of duty or movies or whatever, but this is a much more ambiguous gray zone is what it is type of warfare where you don't always know who's who in the zoo and you're all kind of in the shadows bumping around and one wrong mistake that's it and that's real so like in libya there has been mercenary on mercenary warfare and there's a lot of you know problems with that but that's kind of what the game is trying to capture and i think that we're going to see a lot more of this in the years and decades coming forward so i i kind of think this is a very exciting way to introduce yeah. Yeah. players to having a good time but learning like hey this is actually what modern war is becoming Okay. Well, that's great. Um, it, well, maybe not that to some extent, but we get the, the point. So two more questions, actually. One is, you know, are, are you a gamer yourself? And if you haven't been able to play games much today, pick, pick a game that maybe is something that you always remember your favorite type of game or something. Of the uh, I am a gamer. So like when I was a kid, I was in a video because when I was a kid, it was like the, the Jurassic era. But um, uh, we, um, I used to play these complex board games, uh, like Avalon Hill and, uh, TSR, both role-playing games and those like hexagon grid games. Um, and then when I, you know, then I became an Xbox player and, you know, from the very beginning and I loved, you know, everything from Assassin's Creed to, uh, um, you know, to, to Halo, starting with the original one of Bungie and, you yep. know, and and the open the open world ones. I mean, so I, I kind of like how the sandbox, the open world. Now you can explore and you have some storyline, and yeah. um, but I like that because also it, some of the just linear role playing games. You know, it's great, but it's only you know fifteen hours long, right? right. So I kind of I kind of enjoy that. So yeah, I am a gamer. Um, I you know it's a great way to unwind. It's sort of like it's like taking a jacuzzi from my mind, um, yeah, which yeah. I really enjoy. Uh, likewise, likewise. Some some of us might, you know, I even have friends to this day that I met through what we call proximity chat, which is when you're close to another gamer in some games, you can talk to them. Yeah, right. And we're going to have that too. So we're excited because that's part of, forgive me, I know I keep going back to the game, but I think that's the point a little, right? So yeah. they, you know, when you see that other PMC, even if they're chatting in a private chat, we'll say like Discord, they, you know, the cool kids chat, yeah. then, uh, <laughs> then they they can jump into the game. Right. Be in there and then be able to talk and see if they want to do some negotiating. Right, right. I mean, so. I think it's just really cool. I mean, this, I mean gaming's, games forever surprise me how they can evolve and, and these new tricks uh, and abilities that make the game that much more uh, immersive for players. Oh, absolutely. Um, one of the things I wanted to kind of end this with is what are you kind of doing now that doesn't s surround this? And also, please, you know, maybe a little plug for yourself just about... <laughs> you know, books or something? Because, I mean, I think it would be great to get let people to know you, Sean. Yeah, well, thank you. I mean, look, I've been on a mission since I left that world formally. I've been on a mission to, again, pull back the curtain on this world. And I'm in, I remain in touch with people in this world all the time because of my background, whether they're in, you know, U.S. mercenary groups or they're in Wagner group or they're in Africa or all these things. And so, and I try to tell the story. I do it through my novels. Like I wrote a novel called High Treason. Uh, which I've written three. That's the last one. It's um, it's a great you know, it's a it's a sort of it takes place in Washington D.C. It's fast moving, but they're they're also set in Ukraine, in Syria. Um, I also write a lot of nonfiction on this. Uh, so one book I wrote is my last book is called The New Rules of War. Uh, it was an Economist Best Book of the Year. Um, it's it's widely read in um, not just the U.S. Department of Defense, but in militaries around the world. It's been translated into like 20 languages, including Ukraine, uh, Japanese, I mean, you name it. 
Um, and it sort of explains some of this world, some of this gray yeah. zone world and how you fight and how you win. Um, I also teach at the U.S. Military War College in Washington, D.C., and also Georgetown University. I teach strategy. I teach it to generals. I teach it to grad students. Um, and I do a lot of advising for U.S. Congress, uh, the Pentagon, the CIA, uh, Special Operations Command, and not just in the United States, but in across the NATO countries, across the Pacific Rim, yeah, um, you name it. So I'm actually... Uh, quite busy. And, you know, advising games is not my uh, my normal. Uh, this is more of a uh, more of a uh, of an interest of mine because I want to see the game get made. It's not normally something I would do. So, but it's been really fun. I've really enjoyed learning how games are made. I had no idea. It's so fascinating. Well, geez, Sean. I mean, I think that by the time people are able to to listen to this, I think they're going to understand more of why we call it gray zone warfare. You know, yeah. I think they're going to understand more of even some of the story and lore that we're going to be talking about later this month before Christmas. And, you know, um, really it's, it's very much appreciated. We'll try and do something like this again, maybe. Yeah, it'd be great. You know, and uh, for everyone watching, thank you. We have much more to share and uh, we appreciate your support. And always remember every move matters. Every move matters.